church this morning, helping us honor this, these people, these men and women, and really celebrating this great, this great country. If you have your Bibles, if you would, open to Psalm 91. If you have your wallets, take out a dollar. You say, is it the offering? No, no, no. No, no, no. You can keep your dollar. If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 91. If you have your wallets, take out a dollar. If you don't have a dollar, a hundred or fifty would be fine, or a penny would be fine too. In the back of the dollar bill, which I have here, you'll find you'll find this little phrase: "In God we trust." Found on every currency, besides your credit cards and debit cards. You won't find it there. Dollars, five dollars, ten, fifties, twenties, hundreds, penny, five cent, ten cents, quarter, fifty cent piece, and dollar pieces. Those four words, in God we trust. Most likely they came from Psalm chapter 91. If you would look at me in Psalm 91, we'll read the whole, the whole psalm there. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. And read these last four words to me. Verse number two, help me here. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation." There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name." He shall call upon me, I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Psalm 91 and the trust we can have in you. Lord, I pray for your help and uh, during these next few moments you'd help me to say those things that would be profitable, that would be helpful. Lord, those things that would challenge us and would your word, would you convict us and change us this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Often been said, the almighty dollar. People spend years of their lives to gain just one more dollar. You work all day and you work overtime and what do you get at the end of the week? You get some dollars. If you don't have enough dollars, you find a new job to get some more dollars. If you don't use your dollars wisely, they take things away from you. If you don't pay your dollars to the government, they take things like your house and things like that. This dollar. But we often don't take the time to turn the dollar over and look at those four words on the back, those four little words, yet powerful words, in God we trust. The motto, in God we trust, was placed on the United States coins largely because of increased sentiment that existed during the Civil War. This is according to the U.S. Treasury, our government's Treasury website. The Secretary of Treasury during that time, Salmon P. Chase, received many appeals from devout persons, but it was one that they believe kind of spearheaded and started the national phenomenon known now as our motto in God we trust. It was a letter dated November 13, 1861, written by a preacher, Reverend M. R. Watkinson from Ridleyville, Pennsylvania. He wrote to the Treasury and he said this, Dear Sir, you are about to submit your annual report to Congress respecting the affairs of the national finances. One fact touching our currency has hitherto been seriously overlooked. And by that I mean the recognition of the Almighty God in some form on our coins. You, sir, are probably a Christian. 
What if our republic were shattered beyond reconstruction? Would not the antiquaries of succeeding centuries rightly reason from our past that we were a heathen nation? What I propose is that instead of the goddess of liberty, we shall next inside the 13 rings, or 13 stars, a ring inscribed with the words perpetual union. Within the ring, the eye crowned with a halo. Beneath this eye, the American flag. And in the folds of the bars, the words God, liberty, and law. That would make a beautiful coin. As a result, the Secretary of the Treasurer, Secretary Chase, instructed another man to begin to prepare a motto. 1861, he said, No nation can be strong except in the strength of God, or safe except in his defense. Sounds a lot like Psalm 91, doesn't it? And in 1837, it was found that the Act of Congress had passed that nothing could be put on the coins without their permission. And so Secretary Chase proposed a new design, Our Country, Our God, or Our God, Our Trust. And then he refined it to say this, so it should read, In God We Trust. In 1864, Congress passed the Act on April 22nd and changed the composition of the one-cent coin. In 1864, it was the first time that those four words we're on any kind of currency in the United States, in God we trust. I'm going to grab the yellow mic if I could. My question this morning, is this just a motto or is it a mindset? You have seen it before. Uh, you've seen it before on, on the coins, I'm sure. If you've not been unaccustomed to the phrase. You've not been unaccustomed to it. But too often, we say things without any meaning. In fact, we often say things that we really don't mean. Things like, good morning. Most of you don't mean good morning. Most of you are not morning person. And in fact, if you could eliminate mornings from your life, you would. But you say things like that, good morning. You ask questions like this and you don't really mean it. How are you doing? You don't really want to know how someone's doing because if in fact they tell you how you're, they're doing, you're like, oh my goodness, will they ever stop talking? You ask the question, how are you doing? People will say this, have a nice day. What does that mean? Have a nice life and never look at me again. We often say things that we don't mean, and I would propose that often we say this phrase, this phrase was quoted inside our government, inside our nation, and God we trust, without really being meant that we trust in God. This morning I'd like to challenge us what it looks like to actually have this motto be a mindset. In Psalm 91, we're going to see a few things. We're going to see a hiding place, a help, and a hope. In Psalm 91, it was a psalm that we believe was written by Moses. We'll discover a person, a presence, and a place. I hope before you leave today that that phrase, in God we trust, will not just be found in your wallet or your billfold or your purse. It will not just be found on some currency or coin that you have. It will not just be a phrase that you know is our national motto, but that it will truly be your mindset in your life, in God we trust. I first I'll see when someone discovers and makes this their mindset, the first, the first thing I see is that now we make this thing a person. There's a person here. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm says this, of Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. You have to ask yourself, well, who is this person? And the writer of this psalm, we believe Moses, begins to introduce us to this person that who we're going to say about, in him will I trust. He refers to him as the Lord, it's capital L-O-R-D in your Bibles. That Lord, that means Jehovah or Yahweh. He gives us a small description of him, though. First of all, in verse number one, he says this, he's prestigious. He is the most high. That word means he is exalted. This person is prestigious. God is a prestigious person. The Bible says he is a name that is above every name. He is Lord of lords and king of kings. The Bible says he is the alpha and omega. That is a prestigious title. Our God is not made with hands. Many countries worship other gods and they'll make their god. They'll carve them out of stone. They'll carve them out of wood. They will point to something like the sun and the moon. That's our god. Our god, I introduce you to this morning, Jehovah, is the most high. He is exalted. Not only is he prestigious, he is powerful. 
That's what the psalmist says in verse number one. He is most high, and he is, the last word of verse number one, the almighty. He is almighty. By almighty, that word means power. How almighty is he? Well, the Bible says, teaches us that he can stop the sun from setting or rising. The Bible says that he created the moon. The Bible says that he can walk on water. And the Bible says that he can raise people from the dead. That's how powerful he is. Now, to kind of explain this a little bit, we live in kind of a superhero crazed day. Seems like they're always coming out with some brand new superhero film, movie. I mean, there's superheroes and there's Spider Man and Batman, though Batman's not really a superhero. And you have Superman and, and Spider Man, and you have these other ones that are like Thor, and, and, and Thor is supposed to be a god. Yet he can get hurt and he can lose. Our God cannot get hurt, and our God, Jehovah, is almighty. He cannot lose. In fact, he has never lost. I don't know about you, but I like to win. When you play sports, I don't like to lose. I don't play sports or play games to lose. We live in a culture where it's a, everyone gets a medal culture, right? Oh, good job. You showed up today. Here's a medal for showing up. Welcome to the real world. We go to work, right? We don't get a medal for showing up to work, do we? We're supposed to show up to work. Look at that. You only let 45 goals go in the goal. You get a medal. You lost. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You weren't as good as the other team. You lost this morning, and you played hard, but someone has to be a winner. And if I can introduce you this morning, when the, when the psalmist talks about the Almighty, he's talking about a powerful being who has never lost, who will never lose, and who can never lose. That is God. He is prestigious, and he is powerful, but he's also personal. In those first two verses, you'll see the word of my three times. You'll see my refuge, my fortress, and then you'll see this, my God, in him will I trust. My refuge, my fortress, my God. You see, this God of the universe wants to be personal with you and with me. In God we trust was not meant to say, not meant to be, oh, this far off being. No, the psalmist says, listen, in him will I trust this personal God, this powerful God, this prestigious God, but he's, he's my God. He's mine. He, 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 I can talk to him. I, I, can, I, 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 I can ask him for things and he answers my prayers. He wants to be personal you see, this is so powerful because many religions, many other things, do not want a personal God. But the Almighty can be your God. Well, two years ago, my wife and I were in Cambodia on a mission trip, visiting some of our missionaries. We went to Angkor Wat, which is a huge Buddhist temple. Inside this temple, they had a place set up where you could burn incense to Buddha. We did not do that. But many people came along, and they'd pay a little money, whether they were Buddhist or not. All right, tourists came and paid money to burn incense to some unknown Buddha being. All right, rub the belly and they'd ha hopefully have a nice day. And yet my God, I don't have to burn incense to or rub the belly. My God wants to have a relationship. He wants to be personal. See, there's not only a person, there's a presence. This is a wonderful psalm because it says, He that dwelleth in the presence, abides in the shadow. It, first of all, it brings hope in verse number five. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. It, when the Bible says you have to abide under the shadow, the idea is that you have to be pretty close to something to be under its shadow. You have to be pretty close to something to be under or inside the shadow of an object. Now, I realize there are some bigger objects that can shed shadows, but even then, I can't be under the shadow of a skyscraper in New York City while I stand here in Saginaw, Michigan. You have to be pretty close. And so when the psalmist begins to talk about this under the shadow, uh, and abide in the shadow, it's talking about being close. There's a presence, and it brings hope to us. It says, thou shalt not be afraid. You ever been afraid? Oh, man, I've been afraid before. Anyone who says they've never feared anything is either lying or a fool. 
been afraid before. My kids, if they're growing up, they've been afraid of certain things. And, and as adults, we fear different things than our children fear. Well, they, they fear things like shadows in their rooms at night. We fear things like the unknown at work. What's going to happen tomorrow with the layoffs? Will I get laid off or will I keep my job another day? Will I be able to keep the house or not? Can I support my family? We still fear. We just fear different things. And the Bible teaches us that when we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, that brings hope. And it defeats our fear in our life. Now, not only does it bring hope, but it brings help. For about eight verses inside of this psalm, verses 7 through 13, or seven verses, 7 through 13, it talks about the hope and the help that is brought. It says things like this, that a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. Now you have to wonder when you read the Bible, is this literal or not? If I walk outside, will ten thousand people fall down at my right hand? Well, hopefully not because you're all around me. But understand something, when Moses was writing this, they were wandering in, Egypt, or wandering in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Surrounded by people that did not like them. Surrounded by people that wanted to destroy them. They had enemies. Have you ever had an enemy? I don't mean someone who didn't like you. We've all had people who don't like us. But I mean an enemy. Someone who wants to destroy you. Someone who really wants to see your life turned upside down. Someone who wants to make life miserable. Someone who really would rather you be dead. These people were surrounded by enemies and Moses says, when I abide under the shadow of the Almighty, when I dwell in his presence, that my enemies will have no effect on me because God is helping me. It's a blessing to know that our God not only wants to be personal, he wants to help us. It has been said that during the time of or the Roman Empire, there was a deer or a stag that wandered around the Roman Empire under the utmost protection. Now, I must be honest, I am not a big deer hunter. There are some deer hunters, I'm sure, here this morning. There are some in our church. And by saying that, I know that many of you now will not like me any longer. But it's a different story when I almost got shot deer hunting, not for this morning. But deer hunting, many of you enjoy it. You love sitting in the woods and freezing and waiting 14 hours for one small deer for you to miss. I understand you like that. And then dragging this thing 10 miles out of the woods, so right, sounds delightful, and eating venison. But there was a deer walking around the Roman Empire, a stag, that was under the utmost protection, they say. Because they said that on its neck there was a label, and the label read this, Touch me not, I belong to Caesar. Now, I have not verified if that was true. I read this a few different places. But I imagine in my mind, if that were true, the protection that that stag would be under. If one of you deer hunters saw that stag, and perhaps it was a huge rack on this stag because it had been alive so long, and, and you think, boy, this is going to be the, the stag of the century. You draw back carefully in the bow, and your arrow flies straight and true, and as a, the, the stag falls, you run up to it, and you see this label, touch me not, for I belong to Caesar. What do you do at that moment? Oh, no big deal. Who cares about Caesar? Oh, he won't find out. Caesar always finds out. Oh, you know what? I'll just mount it in my house. Boy, that stag looks strangely familiar. It looks like the stag of Caesar. No, the truth is that that label brought safety to it in the same way that we are labeled once we become God's children. With a label that says, touch us not, we belong to God. I see hope and help in his presence, but lastly, I see this. I see a place. The Bible says in the, in the first verse, in the, about the sixth word, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place. In the secret place. I see, first of all, a secret place. Now, this is interesting. Most of us love a good secret. There are some people who cannot keep secrets at all. There are some people that when my wife and I uh, first became pregnant with our first son that we did not tell because we knew that, that they could not keep it inside, all right? And, and they just love to tell secrets like, oh, you'll never guess, you know, and, 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 and it's fun to share secrets sometimes and not fun to share it for someone else. Some of you have secret places that you can hide. When I was growing up one time, I, I hid in a box. It was a box under an ironing board, 
I was about in the fourth grade or so in there, and for some reason in my mind, I thought this would be a good idea. My parents were, we lived in, a, in, a, in Flint, and not in a great section of town, and they began to call me and look for me, and, and as they called, I, I hid in that secret place, that box. They could not find me. I was right there in, in the living room, okay, I wasn't too far away, and, and they're calling, apparently they're running outside. I don't remember them being outside because I was in my secret place in my box. And apparently, as, as they tell me, that they came inside to call the police because they felt for sure I was kidnapped. And I popped out of the box and said, surprise. What a good surprise, right? Moms and dads, what a wonderful thing. It was in my secret place, and, and they said they didn't know whether to hug me or to beat me. They hugged me, in case you wondered. Probably should have beat me. A secret place. Oh, sometimes kids have a little secret place growing up. Sometimes you, you adults do too. Sometimes you men have a place you love to fish. It's a secret place. You don't want anyone to find out this place where you fish because it's where you catch the big ones. You might have a place you hunt. Ladies, you might have a place where you find the deals in the stores. I know sometimes you ladies will find a deal without the money. You'll hide something so you can come back and get it later on in a secret place. And the Bible says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. And what that means, what the scholars tell me that means is it's referring to in the temple, the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter and only once a year. He often would be, or usually would be tied with a rope around his ankle. So that if, if in some way he was not clean or had not, been, uh, not fully uh, been right before God, God would kill him and they could drag him out. This Holy of Holies was a secret place. Everyone knew about it, but only the high priest, only once a year. When Jesus came to earth, he shredded the, 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 the veil so that anyone can enter this place. And the psalmist refers to this place and says, listen, you and I can dwell in this place. And that word dwell means to set up a tent and to stay all night. What he means is, I want to go inside the Holy of Holies in the temple. I want to put a tent up, temp, tent up and I want to sleep there every night. Because I want to be close to God. What a powerful picture. What's interesting is that that's in the first verse. But in the last verse, I see a saving place. It begins with a secret place. He that dwelt in the secret place. It begins with the last, and it ends with this. I will show him my salvation. You see, when salvation comes, that is also a secret and a sacred place. When the Bible speaks of salvation, it refers to salvation from sin. You see, the Bible teaches us that everyone has sinned, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of that sin, we cannot approach the throne of God. We cannot go to heaven because we are sinful people. Many of you know that of the Ten Commandments, you know, you're not supposed to steal and not supposed to lie and not supposed to covet, not supposed to kill anybody. And while most of us have not done and broken every single commandment, the fact is we've broken one before. Most of, us, most of us at some point have told a lie in our lifetime. And the Bible says that if you've committed one sin, you're guilty of all. That doesn't mean you've broken all of them, but you're guilty as if you had broken all of them. The Bible says because we've all sinned, we come short of God's, God's glory. We can't make it to heaven. And I see in the saving place, I see a solution because even though we're sinners, you find out that the wages for sin is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Many people want to change that. They want to say, listen, you can go to heaven. You can go to the secret place of, of heaven if you're really good, and you ought to be good. The world would be a better place if we had more good people in it, would it not? There's just some nasty people out there. But, but being good won't get you to heaven. Some people say, well, if you get baptized, you can go to heaven. And that's wonderful. You ought to get baptized, but that's not going to get you to heaven. The Bible says the only way, the wages of sin is death. And you say, well, what, are you, what, what are you saying, Pastor? How do I have to die? Well, you would, except someone else died for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God, who we're talking about, this almighty God, this powerful God, this prestigious God, who wants to be personal, but God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ 
died for us. He died on the cross for you and for me. We have behind the screen there a, a, a cross. Our cross above our baptismal tank is empty. Because while Jesus died on the cross, they buried him. Three days later, he rose again. And now he's in heaven. That's why the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible in Romans chapter 10 tells us about trust in God. It uses the word believe. We're just talking about the motto, in God we trust. And Romans chapter 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt, here's that word, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're talking about this morning, in God we trust. In a few moments, we're going to have a, a time of prayer. I'm going to ask you if you've ever placed your trust in God. Not just on a model, not just on a dollar bill, but have you, have you trusted God as your Savior? You see this personal God who in his presence wants to give you a place in heaven forever with him. You wonder sometimes in America if this little phrase means anything in God we trust. And that was wonderful that it happened in 1837 and 1864, but would it happen again in 2019? I found a few interesting things. In 2001, the governor of Mississippi signed legislation requiring the motto, In God We Trust, to be displayed in every public school classroom. A few months later, after September 11th, 2001, Many public schools across the U.S. posted In God We Trust framed posters in the libraries. But in 2003, a joint poll by USA Today, CNN, and Gallup said that 90% of Americans support the inscription of In God We Trust on coins. In 2006, three years later, on the 50th anniversary of its adoption, the Senate reaffirmed In God We Trust as the official national motto of the United States of America. And later on that year, Florida, the state, adopted In God We Trust as an official state motto. In 2011, the House of Representatives passed an additional re resolution reaffirming In God We Trust as the official motto in a 396 to 9 vote. In 2013, a federal court rejected a challenge brought by someone to remove In God We Trust from the currency. And in 2014, the Mississippi Senate voted to add the words, and God we trust on the state seal. In 2015, a police department in Jefferson County, Illinois, announced the words, and God we trust will be on all police squad cars. After they were sued, the police chief said to the organization who sued them, go fly a kite. I like that guy. In 2017, in Arkansas, there's a state law passed for all the schools to display a poster of the national motto in God We Trust. And in 2018, a pastor who serves in the Florida House of Representatives added the motto in God We Trust to every public school in Florida. Later on in 2018, there was a, 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 act, a bill passed in Tennessee requiring them to display the motto in, in God We Trust. And in 2019, in Bakersfield, California, a city council voted to put In God We Trust on every city police and fire vehicle, and it was debated and sued for by ACLU, and still it won. And that was in June, just a, few just a few days ago. But what I'm asking this morning is on June the 30th, 2019, First Baptist Church in Saginaw, Michigan, I hope there will be other people who decide to make that motto their mission, In God We Trust. It will not just be something that is said or found in their wallet, but it will be believed in their heart. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you, that we can call upon you. Lord, I thank you for this nation, the privilege we have to be here. Lord, this morning surrounded by men and women who have served for us. Lord, thank you that we can trust you completely with our life and for the afterlife. I wonder this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, no one's looking around except for myself. 
I wonder if while I was speaking this morning, well, something was going on inside your heart. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you couldn't say, in God we trust was a belief. It was just something you knew and heard or found in your wallet. I wonder if this morning, if perhaps if you were to die today, you're not sure that you'd go to heaven. I explained this morning how we're all sinners, but that Christ died for us. The truth is, it's not a hard thing to believe in Jesus. In fact, you can do it this morning. Often when we help someone come to know Christ as their Savior, we help them in a, in a little prayer. The magic's not in the words you say. It's what you believe in your heart. That's what the Bible says. You shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. And often we, we lead in a little prayer that goes like this, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you please save me and take me to heaven? I wonder, just a moment, I'm going to lead us in that prayer again. I wonder if you've never prayed that before. If you've never put your trust in God, I wonder if you would say that with me this morning. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if the Lord's doing something in your heart. And if so, you can pray that. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him that. He hears you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you please save me and take me to heaven? In Jesus' name. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if this morning... You'd say, you know what, Pastor Howell? I've never prayed that before, but I prayed that just now, and I meant that. As a testimony to that, I'll slip my hand up. No one's looking except myself. Just slip your hand up and down. I'll see that. Amen, I see that. Who else? And I prayed that this morning. I never prayed that before. I prayed that, and I meant that. I see that. Amen. Who else? So I prayed that this morning. You say, I trusted in Jesus. I put my trust in God today. Just a moment, we'll stand and sing. We'd love to rejoice with you. We have someone from the Bible, and maybe you want to pray with somebody. The pastor's up here. They'd love to pray with you. But I pray that all of us would put our trust in God, not in ourselves. Lord, bless this time of invitation in Jesus' name.